Ashari Hanaguine Posnerice Shumera Akadakan Gilgamesh. One of the oldest epics of the world is the Sumerian Akkadian Gilgamesh, the stories of which were composed in the first half of the third millennium, orally told until the second centuries. The earliest mention of Gilgamesh dates back to 2500 BC in the early times and the latest mention has reached us from the 18th and 19th century. Gilgamesh is the king of the ancient city of Uruk, whose legend of his fortunate life and exploits is engraved in Akkadian cuneiform on 12 clay tablets called Tupum. This was the Semitic language spoken by the Babylonians and Assyrians. Most of these tupums were discovered about a century ago by the king of Assyria, Ashur Panapal, who reigned from 668 to 626 BC in the capital of Nineveh, and kept them in his rich library at the royal palace. Although the Akkadians and Babylonians had no tribal or linguistic connections with the Sumerians, they inherited from them not only their prosperous country, but also their high culture and civilization. This Sumerian epic, the world's oldest literary gem, was first translated into Akkadian in the 12th, 20th century BC, and then in the 18th century BC under Babylonian king Hammurabi and divided it into 12 episodes. Large and small fragments of the novel of Gilgamesh, written in the Khuri and Hittite languages, were discovered by the German Orientalists and Antiquitarians Winkler and Pushstein in the royal gallery buried under the ruins of the once vast Hittite state capital Khatushas. So now the epic is known to mankind in four ancient languages. Sumerian, Akkadian, Churian, and Hittite. The basis of the Epic of Gilgamesh is probably partially taken from the ancient Asia Minor folk tales and conversations, and an unknown Sumerian poet collected and wrote them down, conveying an uncomparable musicality with great skill. The epic was probably performed by the minstrels, presenting it to the public through song and music. According to the German Assyrian scholar Peter Jensen, the Epic of Gilgamesh was for the people of Sumer or Babylon, what the Bible was for the Christian world. Incidentally, many episodes and legends from the Epic work have been introduced into the Old Testament with more or less changes, such as the creation of man, the global flood, or the ark landing on Mount Ararat, Noah's release of a raven, and then a dove, to know whether the floodwaters had receded. In fact, many versions of these legends were popular in the midst of ancient peoples, and the Armenian version is also known. Among the ancient peoples of Asia Minor, there are folklore works reminiscent of some episodes of the Gilgamesh epic, in which the hero is called Gish, Gilgamesh, and among the Armenians, it, is, it coincides with Dork Anker in many ways. The two conversations about Dork, which was written by Armenian historian Movses Khorenazi and preserved in historical texts, whose roots reach back to immemorial times, are closely related to the theme of Gilgamesh. In the twelfth episode of the Sumerian epic, it is told how the mighty Gilgamesh uprooted a thick tree and put it on his shoulder and carried it to the city, surprising the inhabitants. A similar episode is also told about Dorkankya.
According to legend, Gilgamesh belonged to the first Urukian dynasty, whose founder was Meskin Gashur, the son of the sun god. Among his descendants was, was Gilgamesh, who ruled for 126 years. The Sumerian epic, which is mythological in nature, tells the story of a brave demigod giant, who, like the Greek titans, fought against the gods. He even rejects the love of Ishtar, the goddess of love. Gilgamesh was the first mortal to try to learn the secret of immortality, for which he entered the service of Shamash, the sun god of light, justice and truth. And although Gilgamesh fought victoriously against innumerable difficulties and dangers, and even though as a demigod he could not have achieved immortality and had to accept his mortal fate. Friends, now let us acquaint ourselves with the plot of the Sumerian epic novel Gilgamesh. One of Babylon's oldest cities, Uruk, was ruled by King Gilgamesh, who oppressed the inhabitants. Hearing the complaints of the people, the goddess Aruru, by the decree of the gods, created Enkidu, a mighty giant in wild form, whose entire body was covered with hair. He was savage, avoiding humans and living with wild beasts, protecting all animals. A hunter whom Enkidu always forbade to hunt turns to King Gilgamesh on the advice of his father and asks for a prostitute whose nakedness the mighty Enkidu will submit to and defeat like a mighty widow. The king entrusts the hunter to the beautiful priestess Shabhat of the temple of the goddess of Ishtar in the priestess city of Uruk. The hunter takes the priestess with him to the steeps and waits at the spring. For some time Enkidu comes to drink water and notices the sleepy priestess who, noticing her, has undressed. The giant Enkidu, who has never seen a human being in his life and is wild, falls in love with a beautiful woman and marries her. The priestess feasts with Enkidu for six days and seven nights, after which he regains his senses and the beasts leave him. Then the priestess Shamhat turns to him, saying, You are beautiful, Enkidu, godlike you are. Why do you roam the steep with the beasts? I will take you to Wald Uruk, the temple of light, the abode of Anu, where Gilgamesh is perfect in strength, and like a wild bull displays his power to men. This is how the woman convinces Enkidu and takes him to the city of Uruk. The townspeople celebrate Enkidu's taming with glee. Just then, the door to the bedroom of the goddess Ishtar's temple opens, and Gilgamesh wants to enter, but Enkidu forbids him. The fact is that the citizens of Uruk are separated from their brides and wives due to public duties and hard work. Unlike King Gilgamesh, and hearing the people complain, Enkidu forbids him to enter until he fights him. The two mighty giants begin to wrestle, but neither can win, after which they become friends and decide together to kill Khumbaba, a monster living in the cedar forests of the Lebanese mountains. After searching for him for a long time, close relatives find and kill the monster. After that, the mighty goddess Ishtar makes a love proposal to Gilgamesh who freed the people and gods from the terrifying Kumbaba and other evil monsters. But the glorious hero scornfully rejects her, bravely recalling Ishtar's six former lovers whom the goddess ultimately destroyed. 
Enraged, Ishtar appeals to the father god, Anu, demanding that a bull be created and sent against Gilgamesh. Anu creates one such bull and gives it to Ishtar. On Ishtar's order, that bull goes against Gilgamesh, with his loyal friend Enkidu standing by his side, and together they manage to kill the wild beast. The city of Uruk is again in joy. The residents of the city are celebrating this great victory. But after that, morning fell to Gilgamesh. One night, in a dream, he sees that in a council of the great gods, the great god Enlil announces to the sun god Shamash that Enkidu will die soon. And indeed, the mighty giant dies, causing deep grief to his friend Gilgamesh. It is after losing his best friend that Gilgamesh begins to contemplate immortality. He decides to turn to Utnapishtim, freed from the great flood, to learn the secret of immortality. Gilgamesh sets off, passes through the desert hilly roads until he reaches Mount Mashu, at the foot of which he meets the scorpion men guarding the gorge. Passing that difficult road, he reaches a forest of Mehen, whose tree branches were hanging priceless stones. Here Gilgamesh meets Sidolar, the god's servant, and offers them a drink of immortality. He leads the king of Uruk to Ushanabi, who was Upshanapim's navigator during the flood. Urshanabi instructs Gilgamesh to fetch 120 poles, 60 cubits long, and together with the poles, they cross the sea to Upshnanapim. At first, they board without encountering any obstacles, but then the passage through the waters of death becomes dangerous. However, after overcoming these difficulties, they finally reach Upshnanapim. Gilgamesh tells him the purpose of his long journey and asks him what the secret of immortality is. However, Uchlanatim, who is the same character as the biblical Noah, does not say anything comforting to Gilgamesh. He states that all men are mortal and Gilgamesh too must die one day. Then Gilgamesh wonders how did Ushtanatim himself gain immortality. Here he tells the story of the great flood, after which he and his wife were saved and became gods and moved to the abode of the gods. Remember that he lived north of Nesothemia, which coincides with the Armenian highlands, and on Mount Mashur, which is almost the same as the Armenian name for Masis which is the name of Mount Ararat. And that's how Armenians call the Biblical Mount Ararat, on which Noah's Ark landed. In making the story of the flood, Ushtanatim emphasizes such episodes that are also found in the Bible. He and his wife, seeing Gilgamesh's mental state, want to help him somehow and advise him to stay awake for six nights and seven days and not to close his eyes for a moment. Ushtanatim's good wife bakes seven symbolic loaves of bread and places them under Gilgamesh's pillow to keep the demons from disturbing him. And Ushtanatim advises Gilgamesh to return to earth from Mount Mashu and explains the place where the tree of life grew, the fruit of which the one who eats it will remain young forever. Even an old person will become young by eating it. That tree grows in the depths of the sea where Gilgamesh finds it. He plucks its flower and sets out on his way back, intending to grant immortality to the people of Uruk as well. However, while swimming out of the sea, a serpent steals the flower of life-giving immortality and Gilgamesh loses the opportunity to fulfill his dream. 
After that, the snake rejuvenates by changing its coat once a year. As you can see here too, as in the case of Adam and Eve, the reason for the loss of man's immortality is the serpent. Let's find out the issue of the sea as well, since Masis is located in the historical central part of Armenia. Therefore, you should look for that sea near it. On the road from Masis to Samur is Lake Van, which Armenians from antiquity have named it a sea. Therefore, many researchers believe that the Sumerian myth refers to Lake Van. Returning to Uruk, Gilgamesh begins to tempt the god Ea to allow him to see the ghost of his loyal friend Enkidu. Finally, Ea orders the god of death, Nergal, to release Enkidu from the underworld. Gilgamesh converses with him, inquires about the condition of the dead, but despairs upon learning of the unbearable condition. Friends, in this part of the program, let's talk a little more in detail about the part of the novel where Gilgamesh describes the Great Flood. The Babylonian myth was discovered in a cuneiform inscription, but its content was known to mankind before the record was found. Those events were reported by Berossus, the Babylonian priest of the god Bel, who lived in 3 to 4 BC. He wrote the history of Babylon in Greek, and this is what he tells about the flood. Kronos appeared in a dream to the tenth antediluvian king Christus and informed him that on the 15th of the month of Diasios, people will be destroyed by a flood. Therefore, he ordered him to build a ship to settle in it with his relatives and to take also food, birds, and four-footed animals. Christus listens to him, builds an ark 15 stadia long and 2 stadia wide and settles in it with his wife, sons, and relatives. After the flood, when the waters begin to recede, he releases some of the birds to find out whether land is visible or not. Because these find no food and no place to rest, they return to the ship again. After a few days, he releases the birds from the nest again, which return with muddy feet. When he releases them a third time, they never come back. Christus thought that the earth appeared from under the water and took some of the planks of the ship. Seeing the ship landed on a mountain, descended with his wife, sons and captain, kissed the earth, built a table, sacrificed to the gods and the king. As he and his men did not return, those who remained in the ship went down and began to search for them. But he was no longer seen by them. Only a voice was heard in the air commanding them to be godly, for Christus, by virtue of his piety, was deemed worthy to live with the gods, as well as his wife, his daughters, and the captain. They are ordered to go back to Babylon and find out that the land they are now in is part of Armenia. They then sacrificed to the gods and set off on foot to Babylon. Friends, this is how the Babylonian priest, Greek historian Berossus, describes the myth of the flood. This story is also found in a cuneiform inscription found during the excavations of Nineveh from the library of King Ashurbanapal or Sardanapal. It is preserved in the British Museum. 
In that inscription, it is said that the gods, and especially Bel, decide to punish people severely for their sins. However, one of the gods, Ia, through a dream, warns Uptanashtim, living in the city of Shuripak, to build a ship. In the dream, everything was not told so directly, and Upshinanatem should know about the impending danger as it happens. By the way, Upshinanatem in translation of the Babylonian word Histrus, which means very wise. And Histrus also originated from the Sumerian synonym Zidzustra. The rest is told with the same details, only the name of the mountain in Armenia on which the ark stood, Nizir or Nitztir, is mentioned as well. After the flood, Bel, learning that Upshtanatim was saved from the people along with his relatives, became very angry. But when his anger subsided, he entered the ark, took the hands of Upshtanatim and his wife, blessed and granted immortality, ordering them to live away from people near the mouths of rivers. Although complete Armenian stories about the Great Flood have not reached us, we can be sure that the myth about the Ark resting on the mountain of Armenia was well known to the ancient Armenians as well. Josephus Plavius, a Roman historian of the first century of Jewish origin, informs us about it. Speaking about the flood, he reports that due to heavy rains that lasted for 40 days, the country was flooded with water, and most of the people could not take shelter and be saved. Then it is reported that Nokos, and at this time the same as the biblical Noah, stopped with his ark on a mountain in Armenia and opened the door and saw a layer of earth. This gave him hope and he decided to stay there. Then follows the episode of sending out the raven and the dove to find out how far the waters have receded. When the dove returns covered in mud and brings a green olive branch in its beak after seven days, Nokos releases the animals from the ark, goes out into the wilderness, offers sacrifices to the gods, and has a feast with his relatives. And here the historian Josephus Clavius reports an interesting piece of information. I read the text verbatim. Armenians still call that place the landing place, because the survivor from the flood is there, and they still show its fragments in that place. According to the Armenian tradition, the place of descent mentioned by Clavius is Nachichevan, which Armenians call that place as old as this historian has stated it in the first century up until today, Nachichevan, that is, the place where Noah, the forefather, had landed. What makes this information remarkable? This proves that the Armenians got information about Noah, not after the adoption of Christianity in 301 AD, but the story has been spread among our people since time immemorial. By the way, according to the same sources, Anakhijevan is considered the oldest and earliest Armenian city. But the information reported by Josephus Flavius is not only surprising. I will read the sequel. This flood and the ark are mentioned by all who wrote the histories of the barbarians. Among them is Beresius, the Chaldean, who, telling about the events that happened during the flood, writes such things. It is said that a part of the ship is still in Armenia, near the Kordva mountains, and that some people are bringing pieces of tar from it, and men carry them about as a burden. They are also mentioned by Hieronymus the Egyptian, who wrote the Phoenician anthology, and Manassius, and as many others as well as Nicholas of Damascus, speaking about it in his 96th book. He says, Above the land of Minyas, in Armenia, there is a large mountain named Baris, where according to the story, many were saved during the flood by taking refuge 
and one being carried on an ark, descended to the top, and the remains of the planks were preserved for a long time. This last passage is quoted by Plavius from Nicholas of Damascus, who reports that Noah was not only the survivor of the flood, but many people who took refuge on Mount Beris, only that Noah was in the ark and saved the animals as well. We can only say that Baris might be one of the old names of Masis, or maybe it's a distorted form of it. By the way, there is an interesting episode in the Scandinavian mythology which tells us about a great giant named Bergelmir, who survived the flood. These mythological songs were written down in the 13th century and are known as Norse epic, the Elder Edda. This is how it's told in the Elder Edda. After many winters when the world was not made, Burgelmir came. The first thing I remember is how the giant cheered. He entered the ark carelessly. It is known from the other Norse tales that when the gods killed the pre-creator giant Ymir in order to create the world from his body parts, so much blood flowed that all the ice giants drowned in the waves. Only the giant Burgelmir was saved, entering the ark with his wife. The corresponding word for ark in Icelandic literally means pipe or vessel. Thus Burgelmir and his wife are saved from the flood by sheltering in an ark vessel. Friends, that's all about the global Great Flood, the legend of which in various versions exists in the myths of different peoples, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more iCup posts and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you.